flag. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Marshy, Marshy, Marshy. You've been here three weeks and you think you can get promoted to seat number one. Wait, 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 wait. Don't get up, don't get up. David, please, can you do me a favour? What's going on? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 oh well, it's me putting my place. <laughs> Katoa, welcome to The Breakdown. A pleasure to have your company with us this evening. Jeff Wilson, Taylor Johnson, Justin Marshall on the show. And you might have noticed, you might have noticed, <laughs> another guest as well. Yes, that was Olympic weightlifter David Leite. He will be on with us a little bit later on as well. Marshy, uh, you've recovered from that? You're OK? I have. I feel like I've been put in my place, um, <laughs> for sure. Geez, three, three weeks I, on the bounce, I thought I could play <laughs> musical chairs, but quite obviously, I, I couldn't. Had, I had nothing to do with that. Nothing whatsoever. Jim Kayes, producer of The Breakdown, absolutely 100% him. OK. I, I don't, I don't want to kind of, you know, take away from the smoke and mirrors there, Jeff, but actually, I think it was you who was putting your hand up to go, me, me, let me boot Marshy out of his seat. Thank you I very much. I wasn't putting my hand up to get lifted. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I tell you, if I did for, for, for this weekend, I actually did feel light. He lifted me oh, up with uh, stop, consummate ease. <laughs> he did. That's so. his strength. Yeah, was... That's his strength. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah, he's, he's used to lifting big weights. <laughs> there is a reason you were chosen for this, Marcia. <laughs> I'm just going to say, uh, Sky Sport, of course, is the home of the Olympics this year. 96 days to go. We cannot wait. So, David, on the show in a little bit. Plenty more to come as well. We've got our Form Super 15 since we've... Uh, ticked over the halfway part of the regular season. We've also got our list of who you would sign long term based on Super Rugby performances this weekend. But let's just uh, let's just start with the round we've seen first of all, shall we? Because it's it's been interesting mm. to say the least. And Marcia, I actually just wanted to start with you. Just from a purely emotive perspective, how did you feel watching that Crusaders performance last night? Yeah, obviously, like many Crusaders supporters and former players, uh, disappointed. But but that's been the way this season's trending, hasn't it? So you, you've got to accept that this team is in a bad place and it's getting worse. Um, so yeah, it wasn't a nice feeling. I, I must admit, I felt down, uh, sat down, um, and didn't feel confident that they could win. But I thought they had enough within them and had the resources to win there. But it was always going to be tough. It's a hard place to play uh, down in Perth and. You're always going to get a tenacious force side. So, look, it wasn't the unexpected, but it was still another body blow. It really was. I'm going to say it's great for the competition. I know you don't want to hear that, <laughs> but, like, last year I would not have even watched this game. I would have watched the highlights the next morning. I wouldn't have stayed up till midnight to watch the force play the Crusaders, but I was thinking this could be close. And the force pulled off what people think they couldn't do it, and they beat them, and they played with so much confidence. And that's what happens when the Crusaders are that low on the table. The force, when they played the Blues, they, they looked scared. They didn't look as confident as they looked up against that Crusaders team last night. They never actually looked like losing, to be fair. So that was great. I mean, the Highlanders losing to the Reds was also... We're not, I wouldn't we're have not, watched that either. We I wouldn't that have watched that either. Table. But again, I watched it. You, uh, and I love that the Australian teams are doing well. We needed 
that. Everyone needed that. The conversation was at the bottom of the screen. What does it say? <laughs> Crusaders have hit rock bottom. Had nothing to do. I'm with just the saying I enjoyed and watching the rugby this weekend. Do, <laughs> say about the Highlanders, just like they had on the scoreboard, which was nothing. Look, for the Crusaders, there's a yeah. lot of things to consider in this performance and what it means. But if I look at the force, and I have to give them credit, and they've made some significant signings in the off season, mm. and that started to come to fruition. And when they picked up Kurtley Beale mid season, that's a really valuable asset into their side, and they looked as though they're a team that can pick up a few more scalps. Yeah, Nick White, Ben, Do ben Donaldson both picked up. Kurtley Beale, like you mentioned. Marsha, you've been looking pretty closely at this. I believe you've got some analysis for us. I have, I have. So, Crusaders, Crusaders, Crusaders. Defence, defence, defence. That's what I've had a look at. And ultimately, good Crusaders sides, regardless of being on the rut that this current one is in or not, um, always defend well. And at the moment, unfortunately, for this side, they are not defending well. And that's what the, the hard part of watching them is. So if we're going to have a look at this imagery, this is from line-out. Now, it starts off OK. So as we're holding on, this is just from a standard line-out. So you can see here, this is the setup. Defensively, they've got backs and forwards looking to defend the midfield. Now, they throw a lot of options to the force at the Crusaders here. Now, it's not a bad umbrella. Severu Reith worries me a little bit that he's been hooked in a little bit too much, but in general, it's not bad defence. You see the trans transition runner out the back for the force. As it rolls on, you can see good defence. They've made their tackles there. They come back onto the right-hand side, the force. Now, what I want to highlight here is the Crusaders players who are actually on their feet. Now, yes, they're ball-watching a little bit, but they've got enough players to defend the threat on the left. As it plays on, again, think about Severu Reith. Now, as we pause it here, he's been hooked in again. So unfortunately for the Crusaders, as we roll it on with that narrow type of defence, it's just mandatory hands, fihakis in no man's land, and finished by Chase Tia Tia. Now look, ultimately, as much as I know the Crusaders, the key to rugby is teams are going to score points against you. But if you can restrict them from scoring points, then obviously you make it a lot easier the amount of points you have to score. And at the moment, two driving more line-out um, wins for the force where they got tries from. To me, leaking points is not helping the Crusaders because they're struggling to score points themselves. And discipline is leading them to putting them in positions where they're also conceding territory, giving the opposition an opportunity to attack their line. And I think when I look at that, I totally agree with you, the fact that some of their decision-making defensively, but also they're not having the same impacts defensively. They're certainly not having the impact on the ball. And the nature of the way the game's being played at the moment, where there's this emphasis on attack and rewarding the attack, it makes it even more difficult for them. They got penalised for offsides a number of times under all sorts of pressure. I'll flip it and look at their attack. There is very little momentum going forward. There's very little, I suppose, front football that this back line can operate off. They are getting met at the gain line and they're getting driven back. Now, if you can't carry hard and create momentum for your halfback, first five, or even multiple carries, you're not putting any pressure on the defence. You're not forcing them backwards. If you're getting slowed down, you're getting beaten at the contact area, there is no post-contact metres being won here. All of a sudden, it's virtually impossible to put good defenders under pressure and the force have become a good defensive team. And the thing on attack as well is the Crusaders of old, their counter-attack was so lethal. You never wanted to turn the ball over in your own 22 because you knew the, the Crusaders would score. And even, you wouldn't kick it back to them either, to their back three, because their counter-attack was so fluid. They played fearlessly and they're not playing with that same fearless passion that, that they used to. I think because it's that... Uh, in their heads, you know, that they know that they need to score, they need to stick to some structure. They, the unstructured slash structured play that they used to play with um, isn't there anymore. In broken play, they're not as dangerous. They're just kind of reverting to carry clean, carry clean. And as you say, the carries aren't getting over the advantage line and then the ball gets turned over. So I think, yeah, they're just missing that fearlessness we used to see them attack with. I wanted to pick you up on that, actually, the fearlessness, because Rob Penny, after the game, actually spoke about kind of the mental toll, saying, you know, the, the pressure on them and the confidence factor, he was starting to see those things negatively impact some of the players. Once you get to that stage in a season or in a team, Taylor. Where, where do you go from there? Yeah, like, no one goes out there to lose. They don't want to lose. And I think people are just, you know, they're, they're killing them in the comment sections. I mean, you know, I, I reference the Highlanders again. They even turned off their comment section because they knew <laughs> what was going to come towards their players. And, look, it's really tough when you are at the bottom and that's when you just have to stay tight and, and trust the process, which is such a cliche thing to say, but you just have to trust that your systems are going to pay off um, and really rely on your, your teammates. Just be the force. They're in the same spot. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, they were at bottom of the table. 
but they went out there, they just had a, a slightly more energetic attitude and they were more proficient in certain areas and they won a game where they would have been low on confidence. They would have been getting slaughtered by their supporters, but they found a way. Yes, they are at home, which is a massive advantage, but there's no reason why the Crusaders, oh yes, I get it, Rob. I get the confidence is low. I get the players are struggling. But you have to be mentally tough enough to find a way. OK, let's talk, Rob because that is one of the big questions that has been posed at the moment. You look at those comment sections you mentioned, people are baying for blood. Inevitably, a lot of that is going to fall on the coach. Is he the right man at the moment for the Crusaders? I say 100% yes, because he needs to be given the benefit of the doubt about the whole season. Mm. He needs to get the benefit of the doubt when he gets some of his cattle and his stock back, the players who are returning from injury. If they don't make the playoffs, then they'll go through a thorough review and then they'll have to have the question marks. Because this team, this squad is clearly good enough to make a playoffs in the Super Rugby competition. So I think you'd have to have that conversation then. But for right now, the fact that he's got a few games, a couple of games at home in particular, Rebels and Reds coming up. They're critical games in the, the course of their season. But ultimately, I think where he sits going forward was if they make the playoffs and he'll have a fit and healthier squad next season, I think he should be comfortable and should get the opportunity to go again. If they don't make the playoffs, though, I think that's when the conversation has to be, well, we need to review exactly how this season unfolded. Yeah. You look at who's still to come back from, you know, from injury. Yes, he doesn't have the cattle um, from last year, but the players who did return, you know, the Tamaiti Williams, the Scott Barrett, David Harvelis, they're still on the sideline, you know, and... It, they only need two wins in the next six games to actually propel themselves into that top eight. It's a very tight competition. Yes, they're at the bottom, but um, you know everyone has had these tight games and there's no one here that they can't beat. Like, like Justin said, they just have to have faith in themselves because when you look at their team on paper and you look at other teams on paper, they can beat them in, in certain positions in certain areas. It's just that belief and then flicking the switch. They're not traditionally a franchise to panic. Mm. Uh, and, and, and that would be a move of panic to sack the coach and say it's completely his fault uh, that all the peripheral stuff is, is regardless of that you know you, it's your responsibility see you later and then it's like you've got to go find somebody else I, 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 it's not the way they operate it's not in their DNA to do that um, there's a that's a family that, that franchise and yes they'll be feeling the pain at the moment but I'd be very very surprised if they make a dramatic decision like that just lastly, uh, before we move on from this topic, I just want to read you out the Crusaders games to come. And I know you've spoken about this a couple of weeks ago as well, but they've got six games left. Rebels, Reds, Highlanders, Brumbies, Blues, Moana Pacifica. Do they make the eight from here? Yeah, they're very capable of winning all those games, mm. like they have been some games previous to the one they played at the weekend, including the weekend. Mm. But uh, yes, they are more than capable, particularly with the majority of them being at home. Uh, they haven't played any real games in Christchurch. And what they need is their fans to make sure that they stay behind them. <laughs> and we know what one eye can Cantabrians are like, my goodness gracious me, come on guys. Yeah, well, yeah, we Hang we in there. We wouldn't be having this conversation <laughs> had they, wa they were in the Waratahs, you know, had they soaked up a couple more seconds with the kick. So, you know, the game, yeah. you know, it, it could yeah. go either way. Like yeah. there were games that they could have won in the season that they didn't. So it's not like they've been getting their butts kicked every week and they haven't. There have been tight contests, so it just hasn't. They haven't had the rub of the green, which is odd for a Crusaders team. Well, that's what I was going to say. You know, it's that's the thing. Yeah. They haven't won those games, though, those close encounters that yeah. you would normally expect them to. It'll be interesting to watch for the next few weeks. Then. Anyway, let's move on to yeah. the Blues, shall we? Absolutely yeah. dominant at Eden Park over the Brumbies. Uh, were you surprised by just how dominant? Why are we talking about the bottom team in the competition when we've just watched two yeah. teams over the weekend, one and two, played really, really well? And, you know, I look at the Blues performance um, last night against the Brumbies, and I don't think anyone expected at this because the Brumbies were the number three team in the competition, had shown some real steel going into this game, but this was a demolition job. And you have to give all of the credit to the Blues and Vern Cotter and whatever he's got them doing in preparation for these games, it's leading to the best defence in the competition is leading to them dominating up front. I couldn't be more impressed by this and individuals putting up their hand. This was a surprise. Yeah, I, I like Funaki. I, I, we've got so many good halfbacks. He's he's putting his hand up as well for Naki's. I'm really enjoying his time at nine. But when he went to the bin and the Blues scored and the Brumbies didn't, I knew that it was game over from them because they just played with such courage. They didn't, you know, they didn't care that their halfback had gone to the bin. Um, but the, the Ford pack were incredible. And kind of what Jeff was just saying, um, the difference with the Crusaders, that they get over that advantage line. Their, their carry metres and contact, uh, contact are huge because um, they're just big, solid boys and, and they're going to work. 
and it's, it's impressive to watch. It was a demolition job. It was, but and agree, but their messaging as well is consistent. Yeah. You know, we, we, we interviewed Hoskins straight after the game, Vern, Caleb Clark. None, none of them are saying really anything different from each other. They, they are all very in tune with their game plan. You know, they were very focused on physicality, carry, clean, you know, um, quick ruck speed ball, and just go at them tough. And they, they, knew, they all knew where they needed to go, the zones they wanted to attack the Brumbies in. So that, that reeks of really good coaching and really good understanding from the players and the leaders in that team. They are very well drilled. They are methodical and they are very much a force to be reckoned with. Let's get a little bit more into that forward pack, somewhat reminiscent of the power that they had in the late 90s. You guys both played against teams, Blues teams, with very good forward packs. How ominous a sign is this for everyone else in the competition? The late 90s. Mm -hmm. I've got nightmares about the late 90s. <laughs> and saying that, I was a part of that. And I think when you look at what Vern has done, and I'm with you, Marshy, on the fact there's a real clarity about how they yeah. can play, but also they know what they've got and they know how to use it. And other teams can't play like this. The fact they've got a number of people who can put up their hand to carry the ball. But then there's a versatility and skill set amongst that forward pack that I think is really important. And, and Patrick Tupolotu, I think, is the heart and soul of that forward pack when he plays. Mm -hmm. They're a different beast at scrum time and carry. But all of a sudden, you're seeing what Hoskins Tutu at Super Rugby level has done really well for the last couple of years. And then their back line is making really, really good decisions on the great work that's being done inside them. So I, I think about the clarity and understanding of exactly what their roles are, Marshy. Taylor, the fact they know exactly who they are, what they are, and the expectations of them. And then that synergy between them and the back line, where this is the right option, we're going to keep carrying. But then you start getting an offload game going because of this momentum going forward. And these are in challenging conditions. I think to me that was what was most impressive. It would have been quite easy to not play. They still played some rugby. So they did it up front, they did it through the middle of the park, they did it on the edges. It was a complete performance. Okay, can I play bad cop? Go on then. We love a bad cop. Do you? On the show. Okay, yep. that's cool. Yeah, don't often play good cop, to be honest, but anyway. <laughs> but that, that's, that's against a team that won't take them on physically. The but Hurricanes the... will take them on physically what and show when though? they last played. You said last week when the they Australian didn't get teams, it all their own way. You said last week the Australian teams were more physical. They've upped their game. Yeah, they. Well, they, that was the best Australian team that we've got on this competition. And they got right out muscled. And yep. they, no, I won't they failed. That. They failed. Yeah. Yep. Quick yep. fire question: Who's got the better pack, the Blues or the Canes? Go quick. C Canes. Canes. Blues. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Hey, I also wanted to touch uh, on the Blues. You defense. can't do that on our show. Oh, you can't can. go willy nilly left oh. field. Don't give us a chance Sorry. to prepare. I need to explain totally why. I think you're right. It's out. Six out. in the paper. It's a script. This is one of these. In Come week on. two, in Seriously. week two, I've become oh, just really? as comfortable as oh, Justin no. Marshall is in week three. In fact, come here. We'll see. Jeff, put me there. It's fine. Now, let me move on. Thank you, because I do want to talk about the defence as well, because I've got a stat here for you. Since they lost to the Canes in round three, the Blues have conceded 34 four points in five games. Mm. Mathematicians, it's less than seven points a game. Defence wins championships. You were talking about it with the Crusaders and how it's completely lacking. So what are you seeing and what they are building there? Yeah, I think we, we give credit to the forward pack as well, but their backs... The ability to read plays is really strong as well. They all know where they need to be, you know, the midfield, out on the wings, on the edges. Their defence patterns are really strong. Equally, like on attack, their, their shape is really nice and you can see they're always in shape. But even on counter-attack, they know what the plan is. And on defence, as soon as they're in that transition period and they go to defence, they're in the right spots. And I think, obviously, after that Hurricanes game, they would have reviewed their defence. But I think, again, they're just a well-drilled team and they're well-connected. Scramble for me. Right, they scrambled back a couple of times last night, was outstanding. Mm. Uh, I think Plummer got back, Funaki got back, mm. offline breaks from the Brumbies. That, that's the attitude of a team. You know, never give up, always defend your line, bust to get back on line breaks. That, 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 that's uncoachable. That's just players wanting to work on defence and get back and yeah. defend your line. Yeah, I, I, just, I just think they know who they are right now. Mm. And they'll keep doing and playing like that until someone comes up against them and matches them up front. Yep. You know, um, whether it's the Hurricanes going forward, but I think they're a, they're a side, they're a contender. You know, they've been a contender for a few years now, though. Last year, it got ugly when it came down to it. It came in a knockout game. They'll have an eye on what they've got, and they've got a really difficult finish to this competition. Four derbies mm. before you go into the playoffs. So they needed to get some jobs done early in the competition. They've done that really well.
Yeah, Mark May 11 in the calendar because that is when the Blues take on the Hurricanes so that is going to be an absolute doozy. Let's move on to the Canes though because speaking of impressive wins, their ability to go over to Fiji and do what very few teams can do and win there. Yes, it was in Suva, not Lautoka. It was at night, not in the middle of, of the afternoon but it is their eighth straight win. They're the first team to beat the Drua in Fiji this season. Is the Cane train pretty much unstoppable at this point, Taylor? I think it's important to note that it was at night time because that, that <laughs> does make a huge difference when you're in Fiji. But yes, look, they trained well for it and thank goodness for their facilities. Like if you watched um, the news articles, they were training in the heat. They were battle hardening themselves because they didn't want to, you know, be shell shocked when they landed. But um, again, they didn't send over some key players and they still performed really well. Um, the Drua, they, they just seem to have a plan for the Drua because the Drua are always going to be really difficult to handle on attack. They, they break. But again, the scramble D was really good when it needed to be. It was. Yeah, look, uh, we all gave it the little, <laughs> little chuckle under our, our tops with, uh, you've got to go to Fiji and beat yeah. the Drua, yeah. who've, won, who've won nine on the bounce. Good luck. Uh, but good teams put all, all that behind them. The peripheral stuff doesn't matter. Made changes as well, which there was a bit of ba yeah. uh, banter about that. Hmm, are they taking this a little lightly? Just, again, a really well-coached, well-drilled side with players that are competing for jerseys. Guy like Aidan Morgan gets his opportunity, plays really well, you know. Kariffi gets a chance in the seven jersey, just goes and does what he does every week. And players across the board all get an opportunity. So Riley, you know, how good was he? Yeah, so, yeah, the, the, they can be very satisfied with what is a very difficult place to go and play and win pretty comfortably, to be fair. And some of those players have been given an opportunity early in the season as well to give mm. them some confidence, and it was a dominant performance. I think they played in Palmerston North. So it's not like they've been on the outer yep. and you've thrown them in the deep end. You've clearly kept them involved. I think it was a really important win for them, mm. uh, the way they went about it. When you get down to 13 men mm. and you don't concede points, and some of that scramble defence you talked about on their line, and then finding a way to stay in the contest, and then... I think just the composure that they're late in the game, Geordie Barrett kicks that penalty from 40 metres to, to pretty much ice it. You're thinking to yourself, because you knew the Drua had something in them. If they scored once, they could quite easily score twice, but they kept that margin just nice and clear. I just All the things you want to see out of that group, rotating of players, um, they're looking really... Great forward pack, by the way. Who did I, I said who was better than the forward pack. Because you, know, you put me on the Wait, spot. But it's one of those things... I, you don't get to like, come back to it and just you know, I do get now. to come back to it. I do, because you, you think about the two forward packs and there's nothing between them. And that's oh, hang on. Love. Well, there was five There was. Ago. Yeah, you had one and you had the other. And if you had time to think about it, you might swap. But I, 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 I can understand exactly where you're coming from. But I tell you what, um, I can't wait to see exactly how they go about their next challenge. Brumbies, right? Yeah. Mm he'll be hurting yeah. and they need to perform so we'll see what happens. I reckon I've had the producers say let's go to the break now about five times in my ear. Well, so they want to pay the bills. Okay, they want to pay you. the bills, let them Thank pay the bills. Thank you very pay much. The pay the bills. Stay with us, there'll be much pay more to come after this including our halfway stage Super Rugby Form 15. Welcome back to the breakdown and if it wasn't already this is where the tension really starts to ramp up <laughs> apparently. We were fine before though, don't worry about it, it's fine. Uh, that is because, <laughs> Jeff, stop, it's he, my time man. He said it, it's he my said time. in my seat, he said in my seat it was the start of the show. So. It is time for our Super Rugby Form 15. Now the rule is, uh, as I understand it, no players who are injured and out for the season can make the 15. Yep. So that is why you won't see a Cam Roygaard in the mix for anyone at this stage but Taylor, take it away. Yes, I am up first and I have gone um, with an all Hurricanes front row. I saw what they did to the Chiefs when they played last week and they have all been outstanding, um, particularly just around the park as well, not just at set piece time. So they don't need any further explanation. These two have been impressive for me. Lachlan McGuano obviously left the Chiefs to go to the Blues to fill a void. Paddy Toops had been injured um, and he's taken that starting opportunity um, to hands. Uh, Yossi, I put him at six, he has played there, because he's, he's moved around that board pack. Peter Larkai, another outstanding. Hoskins Satutu, again, has, you know, top try scorer in the competition. Um, Cortez Latima and Damian McKenzie, 9 and 10. Got to go for them. Um, obviously, no Roy Guard. Uh, 
Barrett and Proctor have been a formidable midfield duo. We've seen them throughout the season. There's so many Hurricanes players in here. You usually wouldn't pick this many. <laughs> Kenny Naholo and Caleb Clark, two very powerful wingers who are just busting through defenders. And Sean Stevenson, I think, you know, is at fullback because you know no one else has really stood out as much as he has for me. But I think Stevenson, um, yeah, is is the guy there. So. That's a good yes. side, Taylor, actually. Yeah. My side's going to have to try and do it very well to <laughs> take it on, but we'll give it a go. Um, equally, I've been very impressed with, obviously, the, the Hurricanes front row and um, Tyrell Lomax Ooh. and Xavier Numi. I've gone a, a little bit left field with Ricky Riccatelli, but I think his consistency and the way that he's playing, he's in the best form of his career. Jamie Hanna, I think, when we're looking to futurise and where we need to go in the locking department, I think he's been outstanding in a team that's been struggling, and Tui Palotu's been simply outstanding. His leadership's brilliant. Samapini Finau for me is just the out and out Jerry Collins type style flank, uh, flanker, blindside, absolutely love him. yossi has been on fire. Billy Harmon in a struggling side, it's really hard to stand out and I think he just gets, roll, rolls his sleeves up each week and gets stuck in. In the halves have gone from TJ Pedernata. I think the way that he's come back into the game, his competitiveness, his attitude, and the type of rugby he's playing has been outstanding and he'd be a good combo with Damien McKenzie. And speaking of combos, Geordie and obviously Billy Proctor have been Superb together and not just an attack defensively man the hurricanes out in those channels have been great at defending threats Severy Reese trying uh, scoring tries like going out of fashion Reuben Love has been so impressive at fullback and for me Caleb Clark another one from the Blues is in the best form of his career I like both those teams, love both those teams. I only got a few differences in mind. Interesting how I said the Blues and the Hurricanes. We talk about, I've got a lot of Hurricanes in my forward pack, funny <laughs> enough, in the form 15, so this is a bit awkward, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so the front row, Numia, Omiya, uh, Amua, and uh, Lomax, uh, Asafa Amua, uh, his status in terms of his injury, we'll see where he's at, but love the front row. Same as you, Marshi, I think Tupolotu and Hannah have been fantastic to start the season. Even though Patrick's only played three games, you know the three games he's played in. Made a huge, huge difference. Hoskins Satutu at number eight, I think he elevated after last Last uh, weekend, uh, last night, Peter Larko, I really love the way he started the season. Took a bit of license here and moved Braden Yossi. I think he's been too good not to get an opportunity to lose forwards. I believe he can play six. Let's see whether that might happen in the future. Interesting at halfback, understand with TJ Piranara what you're saying. Really like the inside pairing. Cortez Ratama, whether it's been off the bench or starting, I think he's the future for them starting at halfback. And Damien McKenzie's just been too influential for the Chiefs. Midfield speaks for itself. Barrett and Proctor, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about them. And the outside backs, interesting. I've gone a bit of a wild card here as well. Clark and Sevi Reese forms there. But Josh Morby, as good as Ruben Love has been, I've seen Morby at fullback enough this year. I really like the balance to his game, his counter-attacking option, his positional play is really, really good. Different type of player to Ruben Love, but with his versatility to play in the wing, I've been really, really impressed. So that's probably a little bit, a little bit left field, but I think good enough right now to start the season. A few things to pick you all up on there. Let's start with what you alluded to, which was the Billy Proctor part, because all of you had him. Uh, as your starting centre. Is that a result of his individual play or his partnership with Geordie or both? Mine's partnership with Geordie. Because um, you do look at the likes of Rico, he hasn't put a foot wrong necessarily, but I think when you look at the cohesiveness that those two play off, um, that's why I picked him there. Um, but yeah, we, we've, we've definitely got other options like Rico, but as a pairing, that was my, my decision. Yeah, I pretty much did process of elimination to say, you know, if Rico was out, and obviously mm. Anton's been injured a lot. You know, who slots in there? You know, if, if it's a crisis, what's, the, what's that jersey look like? And Billy Proctor to me, and the combination doesn't hurt with the likely 12 for the All Blacks, having synergy, knowing each other, mm. um, knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses, and the way they've been defending. Like, I know everyone always likes to look at the razzle-dazzle, but for me, you know, defence wins your games as well. So, yeah, that was where I where I got to with that combo. Great scramble defender, Billy Proctor. Yeah. He just continues to work, continues to read situ situations really well. Saw a beautiful step off his right foot to accelerate through a gap against the Fiji and Drua, which essentially iced the game, I think. It was it was a, a beautiful piece of play. I, I look at him and I like the standard he's setting, but we could, in the last seven years, if we were to put down our Form 15, mm. there'd be a lot of Crusaders in it. Yeah. Because mm. the team cohesion, if the way they're playing, the combinations, all of those things add to form, mm. that's what the Hurricanes have got right now. Whether it's the front row, whether it's the midfield backs, it's those combinations of players. So I think that's the loose forwards, right? They've got their synergy, they, they know exactly what each other can do, and that's that balance between Geordie and Billy is really nice. Alright, I started that nicely by giving you someone you could all agree on. Let's look at fullback, because all three of you had different ones. Ruben Love, Sean Stevenson, Morby. What are you each seeing in each of those positions? And feel free to just 
fight it out, I'll sit back and relax. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Jeff described Morby really yeah. well. I totally agree. Like, the guy's in good form, so it's like, where does he f slot in when you've got to put Seve Reese and Caleb Clark who are in the best form of their careers? So you, you, you kind of compromise and slot him at fullback because you know he's going to play really well there. So I don't disagree with that decision because form is form, and that's what we're picking on. But ultimately, for me, I just think when you think of the style of player that Will Jordan is who's missing out of our game at the moment, Ruben Love really reminds me of him, and he reminds me a bit of Christian Cullen, the way he used to play, like his explosive step that he's got and the ability of him to think about counter-attack first. Not to think when he gets yeah, kicked the ball, OK, I'll kick it back. It's like, can I open up this defence by running at them and taking on a defender that I can see is compromised? I just love that attitude, and I think his spark and his energy is a big part of why the Hurricanes are so dangerous, particularly on counter-attack. Mm. I pick Sean because he can unleash his wingers really well. He, he, he's got a good boot um, and he's like the maestro at the back. Um, and without him, the Chiefs are different as well. You know, probably not as much as when we take Damien McKenzie out, but when Sean Siemens is not there, you can tell the difference with their attacking prowess. And so I think he's, he's a very strong contender, but all great fullbacks. Can I put my hand up then? Sure so No, you can usually just, just go. Thanks. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Well, this is, you know, yeah. it, did you do that at school? I don't think you did it in Matara. So what are you doing here? Well, I just put my hand up. I was going to say, excuse me, Ms. Downs. It's and then you the first stay. time I've ever seen that. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted, I wanted to ask a question. And I, I know I'm not the presenter, so I'm like, oh, well, but I'm, I'm in there now. So anyway. Um, right, I, I'm the only guy that picked an out, not out blindside flanker. Do you guys not think that we have got a blindside flanker? that can fulfil that position, so you, you, you put a, uh, a number eight in that jersey. I don't think we've seen the Sammy Penny Fenau. I, I, I think the job description, I don't think we've seen the best of him yet, and I don't think he's in being better form as other players I think I'll play that position. Now, I understand what you're saying. Like We haven't picked a, a, someone who's played out in that there. I haven't, Braden Yossi, but I just think I've got no doubt I think he can play that position. He's a different type of player mm. um, than, a, a, like you say, that, that Jerome Kano, the Shannon Frizzell player we're trying to replace. Yeah. And from that point of view, if and, and listening to the way you're talking about your team, if they all put on the black jersey right now, the balance of the team looks 100% right. The positions they've been playing, and the way they've been playing, it looks like a... I'm not saying this is the all-black team we're picking, but what no. I'm saying is that on the form, I like what we're saying. So I understand where you're coming from. I've just decided I, I want to see this guy, and I think he's capable sure. on his form today. Yeah. He has played six as well, though, you know, for the Turbos yeah. and, and also um, for the Hurricanes. But in the WhatsApp chat that no one's privy to, I did say something Penny Fina would just missed out for me in that six position. Oh, I didn't see is... that. Look, <laughs> <laughs> I, did. I got you. Yeah, you know, I saw it. It's in the chat. It's in the chat. <laughs> been a lot of chat today. Been a lot of chat. <laughs> what going on? What to say? Um, no one even started on the Highlanders with you. That's fine. Let's go now to who we'll be looking at. Uh, this is in the wake of the Geordie Barrett signing news. At the players that you would sign long term if you were New Zealand rugby. So we're long term. Emphasis on that, all right? So what, four or five years? Taylor, you go. OK, this is my five players. And I looked at key positions as opposed to just the key players. Ten is a massive key position, and I chose DMAC, but we probably need to sign another young ten, and I just don't know who that is as of yet. You look at the Highlanders and the Crusaders, and I know Jeff's going to disagree with me, but they're missing a key ten, and they need someone long-term, and I don't know who that is. I was close to picking Seven Peter Feta, but I wasn't too sure if he is the ten that they're looking at just yet. But we definitely need one, so DMAC's my guy there. Tara Lomax, I mean, front rowers are really crucial. He's someone who is good around the park, good at his you know, bread and butter, which is scrummaging. So I think we need to keep him around long term. Cam Roygaard um, speaks for himself. E everyone, I think, would have picked um, Cam. Asafo Almoa, I think this time last year, I would have picked Samapini, um, Samapini, Samasone Taukiaho. Mm. Um, but I think Asafo's just gone another level this year. Um, he stood up, no Dane Coles, obviously, and he's getting more game time. He looks fit. Um, and then Tupo Vai, another key position, um, it, you know, a, a lock, uh, an out and out lock. And he's he's been good in the, in, in the competition. He's um, in the top 10 turnovers one. Um, he's he's really busy when it comes to around the park, hitting the ruck. So those are five that I would lock in purely in key positions that we need to grow teams around. I like just, uh, the explanation there. That's very good. Marshy, mm. for you, did you have any crossover there? Well, yeah, it's quite hard being put on the spot, isn't it? Because you're obviously thinking about wanting to sign quite a lot of players because there's a lot of talent in this country. <laughs> but when you get asked to pick five, yes, I had crossover with Cam Roygaard. Ultimately, when I looked at it and, and thought, right, how am I going to answer this question? I'm going to answer it in a way when 
even though I'm a very, very much a, I want the All Blacks winning every Test match, mm -hmm. not World Cups, every single one. And I'm very, very, very focused on that. However, these were the players that I thought if we have signed at the next Rugby World Cup, then it'll go a long way to us winning it. So obviously Will Jordan, world class. Mark Talia, he's still in amazing form. He'll be slightly uh, just in his 30s at 32. Um, but obviously Cam Royguard, that's a tie over from you, Taylor. Tamaiti Williams, I think, is crucial to the, 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 you know, the stocks in the future, the way he plays the game, and obviously Scott Barrett, who could more than likely be even the captain. So I kind of looked at it in that way, but I'd be really happy if the New Zealand Rugby Union, if they haven't signed those guys up, so just um, putting it out there. Have you got some insult with oil on the captain? Not at all. Oh, OK, just in yeah. case. You, know, yeah, yeah. you mentioned no, Scott no. Barrett being the captain of the All Blacks, I'm not sure. Well, I love some breaking that news. Just, that's a possibility. Let's bring it it's definitely a possibility. Four years' time, I was saying. Oh, four years. Know, so it's not <laughs> right now. Okay. Right, because he's one of the five I've picked as well, Scott okay, Barrett. Yeah. I think he's critical. I looked at positions I thought would be really, really hard to replace mm. if you didn't have that going forward. And he was certainly one of those. There's my five. And I think Damien McKenzie is critical. Yes, we've got Bowden Barrett coming back, but he's getting on in years. If you think of four years down the track, and to you, you're right. To you, you're right about we want to win in the meantime. Um, I think Tidy Prop is critical. I think Tyrell Lomax has been outstanding. He's been a rock. He's become a world-class player. Um, the Ruben Love one is definitely a now and in the future. He's a guy that's going to continue to develop. Um, you, you know, picked him in, as your form 15. I just love the way his game transcends. The fact you, you mentioned and compared him to Christian Cullen, that's 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 high bar. Mm. And he's got some of those traits. But you know, I think it, to me, he reminds me of the early Bowden Barrett. Same thing. Sure. Ball in hands, ready to go. There's that leadership of Scott Barrett. And then the loose forwards. I just looked at. Some Someone I thought I really like the way Peter Lakai has started his, his Super Rugby season this year. 21 years old, um, he's got a long and big future in front of him. Time to develop him. We've got a lot of guys who are already on contract, but he was certainly one of those. It was an interesting conversation. Now I didn't have Cam Roy go to Will Jordan, there, and, and and I didn't have Mark Talia. Mark Talia is 28. Wingers generally for the All Blacks don't, and 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 we've got plenty of guys who play on the outside backs. So if we talk about Caleb Clark and Sivu Reese and Amoni Narawa and and Atini Nanasatura, we've got plenty of guys who can play on the wing. These are guys I was looking at. I don't want a risk going overseas in two years' time. Yeah. You know, I think there's plenty of guys to replace. Well, on that, that's why I didn't pick any wingers, because we always have a multitude of wingers coming through. Every couple of years, there's one that's putting their hand up. So I picked key positions where I think we yeah. don't have a lot of rotation. And, and the reason why I didn't pick wingers is because we have so many good ones. Oh, uh, I, said we that, don't I did need the same at hooker, though. Yeah. I didn't pick any hookers for that very reason. We seem to find mm. hookers, you know. But this is just the philosophy of, of what you, how you see where these mm. players are at right now. Mm. But when you start thinking about it, we see it all slightly different. Tells you there's some serious talent, right, that we're, we're looking at. And to all those 85 other players out there, we want you as well. Just, just <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah, that'll be handy. Right? Yeah, yeah, Keep them all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Next week, it'll be the breakdowns list of 10 players, yeah. just so no one gets offended and flies the coop. It'll be good. Hey, exciting uh, time for me at the moment because I do get to do my very first trivia question for the show, uh, and it is this. A trivia question for you, the viewers, uh, and you can send in your answers, but we will have the answer after the break. And the question is, which All Blacks prop was named in the 1980 Olympic squad? See that cross over there? Because we're also celebrating the Olympics. David Leedy's in studio next. I'll write something Rugby. down. OK. Oh, jeff has got a twinkle in his eye. Oh, yeah, the blank look is for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come up with something. <laughs> the answer to that question, as well as David Leedy in the house, coming up next. Welcome back to the breakdown, the answer to the trivia question that we gave you before the break. The question was, which All Blacks prop was named in the 1980 Olympic squad? The answer? Steve McDowell. Yep. Oh, I did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, go, Steve wrestling. McDowell. He was a wrestler. Close. Yes, that's right. Judo. Yeah, yeah. No, close, I, I didn't close, know, yeah. close, but yep. that's on a mat, so that's uh, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He never actually made the Olympics, though. He was no. named in the squad, never made the Olympics as the New Zealand team boycotted. David, this is the part of the show where you nod as if you absolutely knew that. That's what I was doing. Yeah, yeah I know. You told me it. about it, too. So. <laughs> oh, oh, we go. oh, what sort of deal are you guys there doing, eh? Hey? <laughs> and welcome yeah. to the show, to New Zealand <laughs> Olympic you. weightlifter, David Lutty. Great to have you on here. 96 days till the Olympics. Sky Sport, of course, at your home of the Olympics. How's all the build-up going? Uh, it's good. Um, thinking about it, my build up to the last Olympics, uh, I came out of it a little bit um, broken, a little bit. So 
We, fin we finished this build up uh, within the next few days and I actually feel like I'm at the, my best shape ever. So um, I'm only excited to um, build up again for, for Paris and, and see what we can, we can do. When you say broken, was that around COVID or was that something else? No, uh, I, I've never actually caught COVID before. Um, I wow. somehow <laughs> sidestepped that for some reason. Um, but yeah, uh, I came out with a shoulder injury after my last uh, qualifier in, in Italy, 2020, early 2020. Um, and I was like, yeah, so glad that it was postponed one year because I got time to fix myself and, and build again. David, I want to ask you, so when you're going to the competition in Paris, or you're going to a competition, is there a little bit of um, a bit of a psych out with the other athletes around, you know? Because, I mean, you're in a, you're in a competitive environment where yeah, yeah. clearly mentally you've got to get into the right space. Yeah. What's, your, what's your mindset in the back room before you do the, the big stride out? And when you get out there, what, what's, what are the things you're focusing on? When I started going internationally with weightlifting, it was kind of hard for me to understand why I was there. Um, what am I doing? How is this gonna end up? Um, and just over the years, I've, I've, I've kind of learned to just be myself. I'm there because I deserve it. I've worked hard to be there. Um, and in 2018, come off games, when we were out the back, I decided to have fun. So I had music in my ears. I had two songs on repeat. Um, and I was just like singing and you know doing what I wanted. Um, and all the other athletes were so serious, they didn't know what to do. And <laughs> they were kind of just looking at me like funny. And so I guess that kind of played in a part where they were mentally confused and not focusing on their lifting. Um, and yeah, history goes and I won gold and now I'm having fun of what I do. And they're all at the back with their headphones on. Yeah, yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that what they're doing now? Is that, is that changed um, at all? Has it changed? No, everybody's still so serious. So, yeah. In terms of your rugby, how, how serious were you at your rugby? And what, 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 tell everybody what was your position and kind of how did you transition from rugby into what you're doing now? Uh, rugby, it's... Yeah, I, I played... Uh, a total of four years, mm. um, not complete. I just took up rugby because I wanted to play with my boys. I was one of those kids who just played um, lunchtime rugby at school in the concrete basketball court and all of that stuff. So <laughs> we thought, why not? We'll make a team so we can go and play and have fun in the weekends. And um, yeah, managed to play in Auckland um, 16s teams and uh, trial for the 18s and unfortunately got injured. Um, and that same time was, um, weightlifting came around, yeah. So it was um, it was hard for me to decide if I wanted to be better at rugby or carry on with weightlifting because I had already made an international team. Wow. What teams do you still follow closely? Like, do you follow the teams or your old teammates? You know, because there's some mm. people in the Auckland and the 16 teams who have kicked on, or you know, who do you who do you support? And do you kind of still keep up to date with rugby? Yeah, I mean. I mean, yeah, rugby is still going to be one of the sports that I love. Um, I do see some of the, the boys that I played with um, on TV sometimes and, um, yeah, it makes me happy because they carried on and, and they ch chased the dream that we were trying to chase. Um, but, yeah, um, I'm a big fan of the Blues. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Richie Monga as well, so I, I, I watch uh, Chris Ada sometimes too. But. Uh, yeah, I'd, rugby these days, I actually don't really keep off with many sports. I'm more into boxing than anything else. Nice. <laughs> when it comes to your sport, though, can you just, for, for those of us who are, are, are less well initiated when it comes to weightlifting, yeah. right? You've got the snatch, you've got the clean and jerk. Can yep. you just talk us through the differences between those and how you actually train for it? So we got the two lifts. Uh, the first one is a snatch, is a wider grip um, from the floor to overhead. Uh, it's kind of like as fast as you can, really. Um, so what's this yeah, one here? This that's the snatch. Uh, it basically takes like two seconds. Oh! So you train for years on end for two to seconds. snatch two seconds, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what weight would that have been? Uh, I think that was 2022 Commonwealth Games. That was 170. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> is that a bit like what you were lifting today? Is that, uh, yeah. <laughs> I struggled to do the bar before. <laughs> yeah. and then I'm looking at that like, wow. I was actually going to, in a really nice way, ask you your weight because I was after a bit of payback, but I'm thinking, I don't think I could get you out of that chair to be perfect. Yeah, <laughs> a, a lot of people are surprised because, um, yeah, I've got heavy, dense tongue and bone, so <laughs> I'm currently sitting at 186 kilos. So. Wow. Yeah. yeah, no, I can't get that up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the clean and jerk before Marsha gets any ideas yeah. that gets <laughs> in the favour. Can you talk us through how that works and what you lift there? So the clean and jerk is a two movement type of lift um, from the floor to, uh, to your chest, which is a, also a closer grip. And then from your chest to overhead, keeping your elbows as straight as possible, recovering your feet, keeping them aligned. And uh, yeah, once the judge gives you the buzz, you can drop it. So what are your PBs on each of them? Uh, snatch 185 and clean and jerk is uh, 236. So, so there, you know, <laughs> obviously you're pumped right though. You, you, yep. Absolutely. Yep. When, you, when you nail something and, and you, go to the next, you go to the next one, I mean, that feeling there, and what's it like when you succeed on something where you know that you've got two seconds to get it right? Mm. I mean, that feeling when you get it right. It's, um, it's very nerve-wracking when you start because if you missed all three of your attempts in each lift, you're disqualified. So you must get at least one in each one. Mm. Um, and well, the plan is open up safe, get closer to a PB, and then try and smoke your best. So those are your three attempts, and you do that in both. Um, and so when you do hit a PB, it's, um, it's a relief and you're happy to, you know, kind of celebrate because you've worked hard. Uh, uh, it's the same with rugby, you yeah. know, when you get a win, you have a few after the game with the boys because you deserve it. It's been a long week and, yeah. It's here, here to that. Some great, great transferable <laughs> skills and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> will we ever see you, you know, playing some social, social games after you finish, you know, I've thought about I've thought about <laughs> going back into team. rugby, <laughs> so um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It, it would be fun to go back into rugby, but at the moment, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> For going to the Venice Olympics. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Oh, you, you, it, you just focus on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that. Um, stay right here because we will keep talking to you through yeah. the show. But now, though, it is time for Millsy's Moments uh, and filling in for Mills, our very own Goldie. Well, I brought to you by another Cargill High School alumni, which is where Mills went to when he was younger. Uh, we're going to talk about my five moments for the Olympics. Now, this is very specific to me. These are not anybody else's. They're the ones, the moments that <laughs> affected me. Because this is controversial. Because in the end, you've got to pick five. And there's been so many great ones. But I'm going to start with the stories that I grew up with, the, the legendary Sir Peter Snell. That's in 1964 at Tokyo, those Olympics, on the 21st of October. Sir Peter Snell, he does the double. The 800 metres, the 1500 metres, two Olympic golds. Just a wonderful, wonderful moment. And I sort of grew up with that, the track and field. That was the guy that we talked to. It had so many legends. So I follow on from that. Who followed on in that tradition? Well, then it's Sir John Walker. And in fact, you think about him in Montreal, 1500 metres once again, carried on that great legacy of our middle distant running. Don't think we had Nick Willis later on getting a silver in the Olympics. Just that silver fern, that iconic moment, so many of them. And then I'm going to stay track and field because to me, when I think of the Olympics, it's track and field and Dame Valerie Adams, back to back gold medals in the shot put. And, clear, shot put. and clearly, I was a shot putter growing up, to be fair. That's what I was when I was a lot younger. Looks wow. like it. Yeah, looks like it. Technique, technique specialist, I know. <laughs> technique specialist, but this was remarkable. Back to back goals, how passionate she was for her sport, how inspirational she has been for me was just absolutely magnificent. And you see how this, uh, New Zealanders around the world, that to me is uh, the Olympics. Now this, now I got to see this man train firsthand in Dunedin, Moana Paul. And if you ever saw Daniel Loder swimming, it just, it was like it wasn't fair. It, 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 he just was lightning in the pool. And for him to win two gold medals in 1996 in the freestyle, glamour events, 200 metres, 400, me 400 metres. I think to me, when I think of the Olympics and what I suppose the pool meant to so many people in so many great countries, but for us to compete at a little old Dunedin at Moana Pool, to go and, and do that and compete on the biggest stage. Now this, the last was hard because there were so many, but I went on a pairing that dominated for years, unbeaten for it seemed like forever. 2012, 2016, London, Rio de Janeiro, the men's coxless pairs. These two guys just went to work. You talk about a team in synergy, Hamish Bond and Eric Murray, the two of them, they were just, Iconic. They just continued to dominate for years on end. 
And when I think about that, so for me, those are my five. And you could talk about the, uh, the Dame Lisa Carrington. Of course, you've got Hamish Carter, who, who can forget that, um, Sarah Ulmer. Mm -hmm. So clearly I'm wrong and let some people down. <laughs> I get that, I apologise, but those are the five that had an impact on me. What about for you, David? Is there any one moment that had a real impact on inspiring you? Uh, well, Olympics, no. No. <laughs> Nah, not really, but I, um, yeah, the same as him, uh, Valerie is a big part of the um, motivational factors that drive me to, to try and be one of the best athletes to ever come out of New Zealand um, and, yeah, hopefully live up. It's a big shoe to fill, but, yeah. Um, How special is it? Because no, none of us have uh, competed in the Olympics, to the best of my knowledge. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, yeah. Team? Uh, <laughs> What is it like to just be in that moment, to know that you are an Olympian? I noticed the rings on your forearms before. Yeah. It must be something really special. Um, it's like one of those things when, like, uh, same as rugby, every kid wants to be an All Black. Mm. You know, um, when you're in sports, every, everybody that's in a sport that's an Olympic sport, they want to be at the Olympics. It's the number one dream, it's the number one goal. So being able to go to Japan for my first one, um, was an honour, it's a privilege um, to, to have the throne on my chest, uh, to, you know, support, um, to, to represent New Zealand, represent Tonga, represent my family and everybody who supported me. Um, it's a privilege and it's an honour. And I always tell people uh, it's, it's such a blessing to be able to put your heart into one thing and be good at it. Because mm. not many people can do that. So. When I think about what it is to, uh, what it takes or what it means to me to be an Olympian, it's that, that's a blessing. Well, well said. said. Well Thank said. you very much, <laughs> yeah. David. It has been such an honour to have you on the show with us. Plenty uh, to come, of course, next weekend as well as we go back to rugby, super rugby, the next round. All the teams back in action. The bye weeks are over. I find it a hard, actually, team, to pick which one is the game of the round. Crusaders, Rebels, maybe? Game of the round. Last right chance saloon. <laughs> game of the round right here, here on The Breakdown. Been a pleasure having your company with us here tonight on The Breakdown. Have a good night. Ka kite. <laughs> Weightlifting has changed my life a lot, especially winning gold at the Commonwealth Games in 2018. They called it an unexpected win because uh, I was ranked fourth coming into this competition. And so when I kind of won, it was, it was a big surprise for everybody. Um, and that changed my life dramatically. I started getting kids shouting at me on the road, um, kids yelling out, oh, David. Hi, I'm a big fan. It's one of those things where I'm excited to be out there and to perform and to compete as a weightlifter because I hope somebody's watching and thinking, man, I want to be like him and do good for not only for themselves but for their family and community as well.